What does it take to pass the local Philippine and the United States Certified Public Accountant Board exam? And what does it take to become a top notcher in both exams? Our guest right now has done precisely both. Leslie Ann Wang landed in the top six in the local Philippine CPA board exam. And in 2019, she was one of the winners of the Elijah Watt Sales Award. And to achieve this award, the CPA candidate must achieve a cumulative average score of 95.5 across all four sections of the U.S. Uniform Examination. Let's now welcome Leslie Ann Wang. Hi, Leslie. Hi, good afternoon. I met Leslie a few years ago in a conference. And since then, I have monitored her achievements and I was very amazed with her recent 2019 award. So now I want to ask the question, why, Leslie, did you take the USCPA exam? So um, in my job, I was assigned to work in the U.S. for around two years. During that time, my staff were reviewing for the USCPA exam and they would ask me to help them when they would have a hard time answering the questions. And so as they would ask me, I would have a glimpse of the reviewer, of what the questions were like. And I kind of thought that I could do it also, even if I didn't study accounting in the U.S. I felt the questions were more or less similar. The biggest difference really was just in the law and the tax uh, regulations because it's all based in the U.S. And so during my secondment or my rotation in the U.S., the firm that I was working with was willing to sponsor the reviewers and the cost of the actual exams. So I decided to take the opportunity and I went ahead and took the exam. Somehow you're given a few months to take it? What is the required number of months to finish the exam? I forget the exact rules, but I think you have to take all four parts within, I think, a year, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a year or two. So how long did you take it? I think I took it in six months. My goal at that time was to take one exam per month. So I gave myself one month to study per topic and some allowance for, you know, delays in case I wasn't able to to follow the, the review schedule I had set for myself. Okay, could you tell us what were your techniques in studying for the U.S. exam? Well, so when I took the U.S. CPA exam, I was working at that time, so I just was able to study at night or during the weekends. Unlike the Philippine CPA, here the review is really online. There the classes are uploaded in a website and you have access to it. And so what I would do is I would play the lectures while I was doing my laundry, while I was washing dishes or while I was cooking. So in a way to, to sort of like multitask, just to have that recall of the things that I learned also in college or the things that I or the topics that I use in my daily job. The difficult part for me was really on the tax and law subjects because those were really something that was different from the Philippine CPA. And so my strategy was to take that part first so that I could see how I would do in the hardest or what I thought was going to be my biggest hurdle. And if I passed that first portion, I would continue on to the remaining three subjects because each exam is also expensive. So um, that was sort of like my benchmark if I was going to continue all the other exams. And fortunately, I passed that first part. And so I decided to continue on the remaining three exams, which are more or less identical to the Philippine CPA exam. And the reviewer also includes some exam tips. It gives you like a background of like, it's all computerized. So you have to be ready with like solving using like a whiteboard and whiteboard marker. And you put your answers online and you use Excel. They have like a Excel type spreadsheet that they load in the computer that you can use. And so there's like a practice of how that works because it's not really exactly like Excel. Um, so you need to practice the functionality of that as well. And, and I think in terms of how the exam is different, um, there are multiple choice questions, but there are also portions where you have to supply the answer. I remember during my exam, I even had to prepare consolidated financial statements. And I also had to write memos 
to the accounting manager and essays. So that's the difference with the two exams. It seems to be a different world, right? Because I know, I mean, here locally is multiple choice. Of course, it's difficult with multiple choices, but the exam that I took back in the days when I took the board exam, it's not just multiple choice. You really have to do problems, right? So it took six months <laughs> to get the results, right? So because it's so difficult to check, whereas now it takes days because it's multiple choice. It's easier to check. So it seems to be like a, a dream to have that here locally. And you were saying something that you started with the hardest exams to see if you will be motivated to continue. What motivated you or what kept you going while studying for those subjects? Well, so since I was also assigned in the U.S., during my first busy season, I sort of started learning the basic concepts of some law and tax regulations. So I think I was able to use that when I was reviewing. And then while during my review, my mindset was, it's not my review right now is not just for the board exam, because I will also still use whatever I learn here for my next busy season that was also going to be in the US. So I was just thinking of it as, you know, even if I don't pass, at least I can use whatever I learned to my work and apply it to my work and it wouldn't be a waste of time. That was good that you're able to use it since you were in the US somehow. You are using it for your work. It helps in memory retention. And my next question is, how is your day like? when you are really concentrated in preparing for the exam, somehow nearer to the exam dates? The reviewer for the US CPA exam includes lectures, practice exams, and then like a run of the actual exam. So what I did was I looked at the time frame of the entire subject, and then I allocated two hours each day for review. So I outlined which topics I would be reviewing that day, depending on the suggested time frame of the reviewer. And then on weekends, I would do eight hours. And then for Sunday, since I also wanted the rest, I just did half day. And so that's how I budgeted it. And I worked backwards from when I was planning on taking my exam. When I work backwards, I sort of have an idea of, hey, are you behind schedule? You're pacing yourself properly or do you have enough time to go out and have fun with your friends? <laughs> Can you describe a little what is working backwards? I got lost there. So for example, my target to take the exam was November 30. And then the reviewer will tell me this entire subject will take you, let's say, three weeks to review if you did it eight hours a day. But since I wasn't doing it eight hours a day, I did a plotting of my calendar and check when should I cover these topics for me to be able to meet my goal of taking the exam and being ready to take the exam by um, end of November. You're really goal-oriented. <laughs> that is the end date. These are the exams. Very good. I'm curious how you really spent the eight hours. Can you tell us because... Somehow it can be overwhelming to think eight hours of study. How did you do that? You really have to be disciplined. And it's hard because, you know, you're also tempted to watch TV, go out. But for me, having a deadline, knowing that, hey, based on my timeline, if I don't finish this topic today, I'm going to be delayed and I will not be able to be ready for November 30. I think that was helpful to motivate myself and to sort of pressure myself to really follow the schedule. Of course, my schedule wasn't very strict in the sense that I didn't have room for some like unforeseen events. I put some leg room also there, but at least I knew if I had to start catching up or, you know, okay, I know I said I was going to only work two hours a day, but it seems I'm behind schedule. I'm going to extend to maybe up to three, three hours a day. Um, so I think having that timeline was very helpful in um, motivating myself because, you know, a deadline is a deadline. <laughs> very good. So you have that deadline as the goal and you are flexible in terms of, okay, I have to speed up. I, I can slow down. But how do you struggle against the distractions and how do you struggle to really concentrate and not give in to those distractions? Yeah. Well, I didn't really starve myself from fun. 
<laughs> I think I think if you do that, it's not healthy also. So I allowed myself to, to do that and give some time to also relax, you know, rest, go out, meet, see my friends. I think if you constrain yourself too much, it's not also a good thing. And it's a balance. It's also finding that balance between, you know, studying and um, also relaxing your mind. Because also, if you keep on studying and your mind is tired, you're not really absorbing. At least for me, I don't really absorb what I'm learning. And so I have to repeat that entire section again. And so I just wasted my time. And if I feel like I'm already at that point, then I stop and do something that I like to do. Ultimately, like when I say, for example, I did eight hours, it wasn't really eight hours continuous. Um, let's say like I did nine to 11 and then I'd have lunch and then I do like one to four and then go out a little and then have dinner and then study again at night or something like that. So really is when you say eight hours, somehow the focus of the day is really reviewing. Whereas other days would be okay, you'll give a little bit like two hours for review. Could you give us your three success factors when it comes to not only passing the CPA board exam, but reaching a certain average that was really huge, like 90, 94% or 95%? To what would you attribute that success? Well, to be honest, I felt also like I had an advantage over the other takers because I use these in my day-to-day job. These concepts, I apply them every day. So I have that advantage in the sense that it's not just memorizing for me. I know how it works in in real life. And so I think most of it is really coming already from my experience when I took the the US CPA exam. And also, I think scheduling, because in the US CPA exam, you're free to schedule your exam whenever it's not like in the Philippines wherein the schedule is dictated. In the US, it's if I want to take it November 15, there's a testing date, there's a computer available on that date, then I can take it on November 15. If I want to take it on December 1, I can take it on December 1. That's how it works. And so other people, what they do is they study, and then when they are prepared, that's when they schedule their exam. I did the opposite. I scheduled my exam and then I worked, I studied to be able to be ready for the date that I set. Because I think having that deadline, having that end in sight is helpful in terms of disciplining yourself. And so I think that's really what was helpful because when I compare what I did to what my other teammates were doing, they kept on saying, I'm not prepared, I'm not prepared. So they keep on delaying their exam. And at the end of it all, I finished the exam sooner than they did, and they started earlier than I did. So it's really telling yourself, when do you want to achieve these things? And I think that was like a big factor in me also being able to complete it. Plus the fact that my um, rotation or my secondment at that time was only two years. And so I wanted to finish it before I went back home. And so I also had that timeline, that deadline in terms of like, I was physically not going to be in the U.S. anymore. Good. So it's learning by doing. We're not just trying to do the exam theoretically, like the local exam, right? And then you have the end in mind. It's not just the exam date, it's the end of your work in the U.S. So those are two. You have another one? What is your third success factor? Well, for me, also, like, I wanted to do something valuable with my time there. I didn't want to just say, hey, I worked in the U.S. and then that's it. I sort of wanted to come home and be able to say that, hey, aside from working there and you know, meeting new people, seeing new places, I also was able to improve myself and add to my credentials. And were you ever pressured by your family, your parents to do something else while you were staying in the U.S.? No, absolutely not. Um, no, I was raised to sort of like do whatever makes you happy. Um, so in terms of like, if this was something I wanted to do, they would support me. If I didn't want to do it, then that's okay also. If I'm successful, they're also happy for me. Okay, very good. So now let's go back in time when you landed in the top six of the Philippine CPA board exam. 
So that was 2010. Did you really aim to be a top notcher or simply to pass the board exam? And what were your top uh, secrets in achieving that? Okay. Well, I didn't really aim to top the board exam. I studied in UP and it's very competitive. We're, we weren't competitive with each other, but it was competitive in the sense that we wanted to get a 100% passing rate. And my motivation was to not be that one person who caused the school to not get 100% passing rate. That was really my, my motivation. I was like, I can't be the one, the, the only one to not pass and everyone else did. And so, you know, because I felt like it was going to be not just my success, but it was going to be the success of everyone. It's the success of your entire batch, of your entire class. And so somehow, you know, I feel like, for at least for me, that was a stronger motivation that I didn't want to let everyone down versus like just me passing the exam by myself. I felt like it meant more if everyone in my batch passed versus if it was just me or a few people that passed. That is a huge motivation. And in being able to reach that goal, something like a negative goal, meaning not to be there, what did you do to really make it? Well, okay, so the first one, um, it's really being diligent about it. It's you have to help yourself pass the board exam because at the end of the day, it's just you who will take the exam. And I remember one of our professors telling us that you have to train your brain to be working during the time of the board exam. So don't take naps in the afternoon. I remember my review class was in the morning. And of course, after review class, it's so tempting to take an afternoon nap. Our professor told us, don't do that. Because in the board exam, you are not going to take a nap. You're just going to have lunch. And then you take the exam again. So you train your brain to be awake during the time of the exam. And so during the whole review session, in the morning when I was attending my review class, and then I'd have lunch, and then I would review again, um, I think at 1 to 4 p.m., because I think that was the time of the afternoon session of the exam. And so I felt like at least my brain is going to know that it should be functioning at this time and that it shouldn't be sleepy. Um, and I think that was like one good um, tip because you're forcing your brain to think. So what will you do? You'll continue reviewing. And so... As you continue reviewing, you're covering more material. And so I think that's helpful at the end of the day. And it makes you more prepared and you're not cramming because you allot that part of the day for, for review. You really stick to simulating the time that you are in the board exam, which means that during that day of the board exam, no sleeping. <laughs> so in the same way, you do that in, in your review. The second one I'd say is you should also help others. When I was reviewing, I noticed that there's that pressure to gather as many reviewers as you can from the different review schools, answer all of them, read through as many questions as possible. And I feel like that just puts undue pressure on you to cover as much material as possible. But I think at the end of the day, it's really learning the basics. And what helped me learn the basics was when I would help others. So I find that my retention is better when I teach it to someone else. So I remember I was studying with a friend and he wasn't really paying attention in review class. So he'd always ask me questions after review class when we would review together in the afternoon. And so sometimes I would think I cannot follow my own schedule and my own pace because you keep on asking me questions. But at the end of the day, I realized that it was very helpful for me because I was able to retain the concepts that I had to teach someone else. I really, really think that, you know, when you're generous with your time and you help others, it comes back to you because then it helps you absorb and it allows you to answer questions better because you know the basics, you know the concepts. Even if you don't read all the possible reviewers out there, if you know the basics, then you should be okay. Right. You seem like a teacher because... Here in the local scene, you have a, someone you're helping abroad, your staff, you help them. Somehow there's that similar circumstance, right? You're always teaching or you're always helping. Well, I think my job now also requires me to teach my staff and to teach my team. And so it's somehow 
just already part of my life. You should also pray. I think, you know, you can only do so much. You can only study so much. And um, I remember my mom, she told me, you, you have to pray because there are just really things that are out of your control. I can study, I can read all the possible reviewers, but you know, things happen that are not in my control. And so these are things that I should already, you know, pray for. And she also taught me that when I pray, I shouldn't pray that I would know the answers to the questions because that's already on me. I should know the answers to the questions. What she told me to pray for was that the questions that will show up are the things that I studied for because that's something that's out of my control. And I think it worked, right? I mean, because it really has to be combination of your own efforts. And at the same time, I also believe that if it's for you, then it's going to be for you if you do your part. Were your parents accountants? Yes, my mom. Actually, in my mom's side, uh, three of them are, are accountants and, and all of them topped the board exam. <laughs> Did you take accounting because of those family influences? Not really. I took it because I didn't really know what I wanted to do after high school. I didn't have concrete plans and I took the course that I felt like would give me the most options or flexibility in terms of what my future would look like. If you're supervising younger people in your company, in your work, are there some attitudes that they have to foster while still reviewing for the board exam? It's really important that you have the confidence that you can do it. I noticed, especially like, I think the board exam results for this year just came out. And I noticed that those who made it were confident when they took the exam, meaning they know they've done their best and they didn't waste the, the review time that they were given. And they believed that they could pass the exam. And those who didn't make it had a completely different attitude. And when I would ask them what they were doing when they were reviewing, there were times when they would not really be focused on the board exam, but on other extracurricular activities. So I think that really plays a big role, you know, the, in the result of the exam for you. Very good. And going back again in time, before you landed top six, you were also, you finished your accountancy in UP as a cum laude. And I remember um, a similar live stream that I did with the uh, chairman right now of SGB, Wilson Tan. And he said, I remember it particularly that he said, it's much more important to have Latin honors than to be a top notcher because really the Latin honors signified many years, in your case, five years of study habits. Would you agree to that? Yes, I would agree to that because also the college the topics are more diverse and I feel like it's not just focused on accounting. So in a way, you're sort of like also an all-arounder, <laughs> if that's even a word. But you have to be good all around for you to be able to achieve your Latin honors. Did you start really excelling from first year or was there a time that you really made a sprint to reach the cum laude honors? Were you diligent from day one of college? Well, for me... I feel like in terms of my college life, I feel like it was a well-rounded experience. I didn't really put too much pressure on myself to, to have Latin honors or to be in the top whatever of my class. I also made sure that I had a good experience in terms of making friends, going out with them, joining organizations, because I think college is not just all about grades. So of course you have to get good grades because then how will you find a job? Um, but you also have to develop other skills outside of like, you know, what is graded. You know, you also have to have social skills. You have to learn how to um, organize events. Um, you also have to learn how to meet new people, carry a conversation. And so I think those are also skills that you should be able to learn in college and also, learn how to have fun and not just put too much pressure on yourself to, to top the board exam, to get Latin honors. Because while that's important 
and it will be to your benefit. I think long term into your career, it will all even out. For example, if you didn't graduate with Latin honors or even if you didn't top the board exam, you will still be able to catch up with those who did. If you are a person who is responsible, who is diligent, who is hardworking, and I really, really believe that and I see that in the people I work with. I have seen people who are um, with Latin honors and not with Latin honors. And sometimes in terms of performance, those without Latin honors do better. And so while it's important, it's not everything. And there are other skills that you should also be developing in your college life and not just be so, so hyper-focused on grades alone. Very good. That's really something new because if, for example, um, my classmate Will Santan would say having Latin honors is much more important than being a top-notcher. For you also, you have added it's not even that because you can catch up. I like th- that idea because there's always hope. Like you make a mistake, you fail in the first year, there's still hope for the next four years. And then again, it's really the attitude. It's building up some skill sets. As you said, social skills are really also very important. Is not just being focused on the grades. Yeah, and it's like, it's not the end of the world, right? Um, if, for example, you're aiming to be to have Latin honors and you don't get it, it's not the end of the world. And it doesn't mean that you will forever be behind those who got Latin honors. That's not true at all. There are many, many opportunities for you to be able to not just be at par with them, but maybe even surpass them. I'm very thankful, Leslie, for you coming over. I mean, really stopping your work at this work day. Thank you very much for coming. And if you have some farewell messages to our students right now, you have the time. Well, first of all, good luck in your journey from college or wherever you are. Maybe you're, you may be in college or you're preparing to take the board exam or you're maybe starting off your career. Just know that There are always going to be opportunities for you out there. Even if you fail, you can always try again and don't give up because there's always going to be something for you as long as you work hard and and, and you're diligent and you want something and do something to pursue that goal. 